I am here uh, on Alberta Avenue in my home, and I have been here for many, many years. Uh, why here, you might ask? Well, this is a place in Toronto that uh, uh, is on the outskirts of what was the old Little Italy, and I moved here in the 1980s when it was uh, still uh, replayed, when this neighborhood had become the new Little Italy. Um, I've been here because of a number of reasons. Uh, foremost among them is because I wanted to be near my kids when I separated from their mother. And so this is a house that uh, has seen a lot of uh, happiness with children and with friends. Uh, it's also in a neighborhood that is um, uh, like a little village, I'd sing. It's, I mean, the, the, it's, a, it's a pocket of houses just, uh, uh, in, uh, sent, just north of the city center. Um, you know, it, it used to be that uh, if you lived north, north of Bloor Street, you are nobody. Uh, I'm just south of St. Clair now, which has given me a certain cachet. If you live north of St. Clair, you're living in the outskirts of Toronto. I, I love this neighborhood. I love my neighbors. I've seen a change from um, a rooming house neighborhood in the 1980s when I first moved, uh, in the 1990s, I should say, when I first moved over here. And now all sorts of young families have moved in because the uh, real estate here seems to be affordable uh, for them. Uh, and uh, what I love most about it, in the morning I wake up and I, in my study upstairs where I uh, look out the window, it's the voices of children playing that I find uh, uh, reassuring. Uh, I find it uh, a solace. Because as you know, working on your own from home, uh, writing or translating or preparing a lecture can be quite lonely. And the presence of children singing and yelling and screaming and chasing each other uh, outside my window, uh, be it winter or summer, um, is a wonderful reminder that uh, life is good and this place has been good. Toronto was a destination for the last great wave of uh, migration from uh, southern Italy. Uh, and I, my family came to Toronto in 1959. And there's a, there's a kind of uh, uh, interesting story around that. We came to Toronto because we were sponsored by someone who had been given British subject status by the British government because of they were uh, a soldier. Uh, in the Second World War in Africa fighting for the English. And uh, they ended up in Bristol in England, uh, and uh, actually in Cheltenham in England, and they were farmers. And then they, uh, as British subject, they could move to anywhere in where the, the Commonwealth, and they moved to Toronto. So because of the way immigration worked at the time, which you, you had to be sponsored, we were sponsored by uh, a maternal uncle of mine who had a British subject a status, and so we ended up in Toronto. It was 1959 and I was 12 years old. Not a word of English I spoke, so it was a, a really a, a fundamental redirection of what my life could have been had I stayed in Italy. Uh, I had a discussion about this later in, in my father's life. I asked him before he died whether he had uh, any regrets about uh, taking us to Canada, and he said none. Uh, he was happy with his decision. And it turned out to be a very good decision for all of us because in the end we ended up uh, doing something that in Italy would, have, would not have been possible for us to do, particularly because of the class status, but also because of the north-south uh, situation in Italy. So uh, I ended up pursuing lines of uh, personal interest, uh, creative work that I probably would not have been able to do uh, in Italy. And uh, uh, so Toronto uh, was turned out to be a very happy destination, even though I wa it wasn't chosen by any of us. Toronto chose us as opposed to we choosing Toronto. Uh, many of us who live in Pittsburgh, who live in Toronto, who live in Argentina, I have family in Argentina. You may see them in this picture behind me. Uh, my grandfather actually migrated to Argentina in the 1920s and stayed there until uh, after the Second World War. So there was a large extended family uh, when we arrived in Toronto, all of whom lived uh, near each other on Gray Street and Euclid Street in Toronto, in Toronto's older Little Italy. And I'm talking about the late 50s now and the early, early 60s. So Britain figures indirectly in the story of uh, migration. Uh, yes, I'm the oldest of four uh, brothers, uh, two brothers and a sister and my two parents. Uh, but uh, when we, we have an extended family in Toronto that is very large. Uh, I have uh, uh, people who I, uh, the, the, the last surviving member of the previous generation, Maitia Teresa, lives on, uh, 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 on, on Euclid Avenue where we all, will, all were raised. And she has a, an extended family as well. 
So, you know, one of the things that I remember very fondly, and my children who are spread out, one of them lives in Vancouver, and two of them live in Toronto, uh, what they remember very fondly is the gathering together on Sundays at my mother's house. And there were about 18 to 20 people who were just um, gathered together for, uh, for the traditional Sunday lunch, which my mother prepared. I came here, I was uh, 12 years old, and we arrived in April on uh, April the 7th at uh, Union Station after a three-day uh, train ride from Halifax, from Pier uh, 21. And, uh, you know, I've been always preoccupied with uh, the question that uh, the great Canadian critic Northrop Fry once asked, which is that the, the question for Canadians is not who am I, it's not a question of identity as such, but where is here? And uh, where is here? as an important uh, uh, question for all migrants, but in my particular case, I got a first taste of it in, uh, in Halifax at Pier 21, when uh, um, we landed at Pier 21 and we were, it was a festive occasion. We had finally arrived after eight or 10 days at sea. Uh, it was late March, so we were welcomed and there was a welcoming party from the Canadian government and a welcoming basket of, with, with gifts in it. And uh, I remember my father bringing this basket to my mother, and there was in it all sorts of things, including Wonder Bread, you know, the very white bread. And my mother said, Che cos'è questo? And my, my, my father said, Mi sembra che pani. She cried and she said, A dove mi portasti? Where have you brought me? So immediately, is, where is here? Uh, uh, because we were faced uh, with uh, this uh, contrast between the fact that my mother, who made her own bread, uh, uh, and, uh, and made bread every week for the whole family, she was faced with this new reality and this type of different kind. So it's a cultural shock immediately. My uncle had called from uh, uh, Euclid Avenue, from Brunswick Avenue, where they lived at the time, and wanted to speak to me, and I had never used a telephone in my life. So much fun was made of the fact that I didn't know which end was which, and uh, when I was supposed to pass the telephone on to my father to greet his brother-in-law, I actually hang up, you know, put it back in its, in its cradle. Um, what I loved about uh, Toronto immediately was uh, that although it was, um, you know, it was 1959 in April, it was a sunny day, and I couldn't believe it was so cold. I could not, not associate sunny days with cold, uh, cold weather, feeling cold in the, in, the, in the sun. We ended up living on, on Gray Street, and my first walk was to, uh, to College Street, where uh, the second day I was here, I saw my very first movie on a big screen, and it was uh, The Bridge on the River Kwai in Italian at the Pylon Theater. And I thought I'd died and gone to heaven, basically. There was also a little bookstore next to the uh, Pylon Theater, um, which sold, um, you know, the old Italian uh, magazines like Grand Hotel and Bolero, where you could follow, uh, for, you know, uh, graphic novels. Uh, and I remember reading the very first books uh, uh, in graphic, uh, uh, version in this in this uh, two in Bolero and in uh, Grand Hotel. So my first uh, uh, reading in Canada was in Italian, but it was of English novels like Wuthering Heights, Cime Tempestose, and L'Isola del Tesoro, or Treasure Island, which were presented in, uh, in you know in, in, in installments in puntate in episodes. Uh, in these two magazines. So uh, initially, initially it was a shock, but then within three or four days I realized that this was a, an incredibly good move until I went to St. Francis of Assisi School uh, where I, I was put in grade seven. Um, and um, I remember a, a couple of things that really uh, uh, tell a whole story of immigration from my point of view. Um, one is that it was I was playing soccer. They were playing soccer in the, during recession. And I dribbled the ball away from someone else. And literally, my first words in English were a punch in the stomach. And the guy says, you fucking wop. I didn't know what wop meant. Or, so eventually, I found out. So that was my first experience. And the other experience was that uh, uh, those of us who went to school in the 1950s in Canada, particularly in the Catholic system in Toronto, where basically there was a routine in the morning. The first bell rang, you froze wherever you were. The second bell rang, you ran to your uh, uh, line, and you, and you stayed there, you didn't, you didn't speak. And then the third bell, and you marched into the school, and then once you were in the school, you could speak. Um, 
next to me, as, as, the, as the first bell rang, was a young boy, younger than me, who didn't know what he, wanted to, what he was supposed to do. He just arrived. As we used to say, he was off the boat. And uh, uh, he said, cosa devo, cosa devo fare, cosa devo fare? Stai zitto, stai zitto. I didn't make it in time because um, Mr. Manzo, who was the uh, teacher there, uh, saw him and he made a beeline for him. And he picked him up from the lapels and he started yelling. The, the guy was so completely paralyzed by this. He didn't know what was happening to him. And I will never forget that there was an older boy who had been here for... Um, uh, two or three years before us, he was in grade eight, and he made a beeline for the teacher, and he said, you put this boy down now, or I'm gonna break your teeth. I, his, I still remember his name, his name was Costantino Cervoni, and I think a statue should be uh, made to him to honor his uh, courage at, at that point, because here was the full weight of the Canadian authorities, to which we were not, you know, had no knowledge of or experience, and uh, uh, it was, in a sense, a, a culturally violent encounter, first encounter. My father couldn't find work. These were the so-called Diefenbaker Depression years in, uh, in Canada. And so my mother decided that we had made a mistake. And uh, she and my three younger siblings returned to uh, Calabria, where we're from. And I stayed here with my father, which meant my education was interrupted. I, uh, first of all, uh, I was told by St. Francis of Assisi School when I went to grade nine that I should not bother going to Harvard Collegiate or any of the collegiates because I would amount to nothing. So they streamed me into the technical uh, stream and I went to, say, to uh, Central Technical School where I could learn things like carpentry and machine shop and, like, you know, and so on. But it didn't last very long. I quit after one year because we were, we were to work together and make money to... Uh, to return to Italy, to pay our debts in return to Italy. So I have a very, very um, patched education. I don't really have, I never, I never really went to high school and uh, got to university by roundabout uh, ways. And uh, therein lies the story of, uh, I think, the great generosity of people that you can meet during the course of, uh, of your life. So I uh, ended up uh, quitting school after grade nine working uh, in factories. I was working at Tip Top Tailors. I had been a, a tailor's apprentice in, uh, in Mayrato, and then I ended up working as a, as a, as a tailor uh, in the big factory on um, Lakeshore Boulevard in Toronto. Um, and I uh, uh, was there for two or three years. And I went to night school. And in night school, I met uh, an older um, um, Italian-Canadian man whose name is Marcello Febbo, who became a good friend of mine. And he was working, he's a painter and a musician. He was 25, 26 at the time, and I was about 19. And he, he said, you know, we, we should, uh, you should come and work for the bank. Or he, he was working as a, as a boy Friday, I think, uh, for the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. And uh, he said, we should, you, you should come and work for the bank. That's, uh, you know, what are you, do, what are you doing in a factory? A bank is better for you, it's, uh, you know. It turned out that uh, it was shift work. So I ended up working for the Bank of Commerce, the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce at the time, uh, on the corner of uh, University Avenue and King Street. Um, uh, and uh, it was shift work from 4.30 to midnight. I ended up being the supervisor of um, uh, uh, kind of a key punch a group of people who punched uh, holes in the checks so they could be sorted out through old fashioned computers. Uh, and that allowed me to be free in the daytime. So I decided to um, approach a number of high schools to see if uh, I could return to school in the daytime. And everybody wanted me to go back to grade nine. And I said, I haven't got time for that. All I want is to get, to do, to get enough credits to go to university. And I went to about five or six schools. And then I went to Blur Collegiate. And uh, I talked to the uh, principal there, uh, Mr. Wiley. Mr. Ed Wiley, and I said, and he said to me, so, Sonny, he goes, it's 1965, everybody's dropping out, you want to drop back in? And at least that's the way I remember the story. And I said, yes, sir, and what do you want to do? He says, I would like to be able to, in two years to do enough credits to uh, see if I can get into university. He says, I tell you what, he says, here are the school ledgers. Remember, you cannot take grade 11 math without having grade 10 math. You know? So you make up a class and you come and see me tomorrow morning. So my friend Marcello and I 
um, made up a, a, a schedule. We went to uh, Mr. Wiley, and Mr. Wiley said, uh, uh, I think this is doable. Come with me. So he took us to the uh, vice principal, whose name was Mr. Stubbs. And Mr. Stubbs asked me how old I was. And he was interrupted by Mr. Wiley. He said, Mr. Stubbs, Damiano here is a grown-up. He's joining us as a mature student. I didn't, re didn't realize it at the time, but he was actually breaking the law to allow me to back, back in school because you had to be uh, 23 to be a mature student, and I was only 19. In 1967, I enrolled in uh, philosophy at the University of Toronto and uh, then continued on and eventually went into a... Uh, I went to study at the University of Florence and then came back and went back to Toronto and was uh, heading into an academic career when uh, something quite interesting happened. I was called by the CBC and I was asked if I would be willing to be interviewed for a job to host a multicultural program. So I matured at the right time as the, in 1971 when the multiculturalism policy of Pierre Elotureau Trudeau was introduced. I, they needed someone with an ethnic background. And there I was at the CBC um, being um, invited to audition for, uh, to host a program about uh, ethnic affairs in Canada, a program that was called Identities. And then that was the start of a long career at the CBC for me. I moved away from academic life into a production of cultural uh, items for radio and documentaries and uh, radio drama and, and you know, uh, literary programming and so on. And then I eventually became a, a manager in the department. I, I left CBC in about 10 years ago now, actually more than 10 years ago, about 12 years ago. And by the time I uh, had uh, done that, uh, I realized that, uh, you know, I had, uh, um, through good fortune, through meeting people like Marcello and meeting people like Ed Wiley, I had the good fortune to be uh, able to knock on doors that would open for me. And uh, uh, I joined the CBC at the time when CBC radio and television were still um, publicly supported in this country with some enthusiasm as a necessary public service, pu public cultural uh, service. So I was there at the best time. Uh, things started to change in the 1990s when budgets became a problem. And the only thing you can say to people is no. I was there at the time when people would actually say yes. I remember Mark Starowitz, who was uh, one of the uh, founders of the program uh, as it happens on radio, and eventually he did the People's History, People's History of Canada for CBC Television. You went to Mark with an idea, and he would say, here's the tape recorder and $100, come back with uh, what you have found. So there was an invitation to, it was a great time for, for young people uh, of Canada at the time, partly through the, this openness to, to youth, partly through uh, multiculturalism, uh, partly also uh, through in initiatives of the uh, government at the time, the Liberal government at the time, local initiatives programs and uh, a company of young Canadians. Um, people tend to forget now because the history is, uh, is not something that we uh, um, are au courant with. But uh, if it wasn't for the local initiative programs, at the time, many of the theater companies in this country would not exist. We founded a theater company, a bilingual theater company in 1971, because we, we had access to uh, $100 a week from uh, the local initiatives program. And that started me also on a, on a career as, a, as an actor and as a, as a director and a stage and a director and a, and a radio drama uh, producer. So I've, I've, uh, I count my lucky stars and I'm very grateful to my father's decision uh, to bring us to this country uh, in 1959. Things could not have gone better for me. So, you know, in, uh, in 1974, when I was uh, invited by Geraldine Sherman uh, to join the production team for a program called Identities on CBC Radio, it was a program dedicated to um, issues having to do with eth ethnic life, multicultural life in Canada. And uh, I, had, I was in the middle of a master's degree at the time in, in, in uh, philosophy and drama. 
at the University of Toronto, but I was intrigued by this offer of uh, what I thought uh, was a, an absolutely stellar opportunity here for me to, uh, to do something which I wanted to do, which is not just be limited by academic research, but uh, work in the, in the actual world of culture. Well, that turned, to be a, turned out to be a kind of a mixed blessing, to tell you the truth, because uh, Identities was a program that was more interested in uh, folkloric, uh, traditions, uh, traditions of around uh, cooking, around uh, uh, ritual events like weddings and uh, funerals and so on and so forth. And I certainly was very happy to do it, but it was something that I wasn't planning to devote my life to in terms of becoming a reporter for these issues. And so, so I decided that I would leave, leave the CBC uh, and uh, return to academic life, which I did. Uh, and at the same time, uh, at the same time, I, uh, you know, when I returned to academic life, uh, I kept in touch as a freelance. And eventually, it was a question of, do I really want to stay in the academic world, or is there a job for me uh, at the CBC? And the turning point was uh, uh, an interview for a tenure track position uh, uh, at the University of Western Ontario where I was assured pretty much that I, you know, there was, was a formality. And then I realized that this whole question of uh, tension between, uh, let's say, the, uh, you know, uh, establishment of the university and new hires in the university, uh, it was a, a very tough le lesson for me to, to accept. And eventually returned to the CBG three or four years later when I realized that I could, uh, um, um, you know, work on a program like Ideas, Radio Ideas, which was, a, and my first, my first documentary was on Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, it was a, 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 a one-hour piece called Zarathustra Rising, and the piece featured uh, an interrogation of Nietzsche with f actors who became well known. Uh, Nick Mancuso played Nietzsche, and uh, uh, um, uh, a, a young man from uh, Rod Beatty who is uh, well known at the Stratford Festival, was the, the judge interrogating Nietzsche on his, uh, and so on. And that saw me re-entering the, into, the, into the CBC, uh, pursuing my own interest, uh, where you couldn't ask for more. This was an opportunity to, to, to uh, do, um, to apply the academic research that I had done to make programs that are listened to by thousands of people. And so I decided to withdraw from the university and continue. Um, at the CBC, where eventually I became the head of drama and features. The program Anthology, which at the time was the only review of uh, Canadian literary fiction. I'm talking about the early uh, 70s now. Uh, and uh, I had done for them a documentary on, an Italian, on a conference which took place in um, I think in Rome in 1984, through the agency of the Canadian Cultural Centre in Rome, which at the time was uh, run by a man called Gilbert Reed. And uh, uh, there was this conference in Rome on Italian-Canadian writing. And it was uh, one of these situations where if the plane that uh, carried us all to Rome had fallen, the first generation of Canadian writing would have been gone, disappeared, like the soccer team in Peru or whatever it happened in South America. Uh, but it was an interesting three days in Rome because we were, uh, as Italian Canadians, smack in the center of uh, um, the capital of Italian culture. The Italians didn't know what to make of us. The Canadians, who I mean, you know, Adrian Clarkson was there as one of the uh, uh, speakers, didn't quite know what to make of us. Um, so, but it was an entry point into that that very very complex relationship between two cultures. Uh, actually three cultures, the official culture in Canada, the official culture in Italy, and the, this group of Italian Canadians who are trying to bridge both of them, who are trying to find a home uh, in both of them. And I remember Bob Weaver listened to a documentary of mine on this issue, and uh, he says, and he, uh, Bob, Bob Weaver, by the way, is uh, you know, the granddaddy of Candlelit in many ways, and he became a good friend of mine. And at the time he said, this is such a, such a serious piece of work for an Italian. I said, you know, Bob, since had I known that this was your attitude, I would have brought my accordion and danced to the tarantella for you. <laughs> we both had a laugh. Uh, but it was a, it was a moment of, uh, uh, for me, a moment of entry, a point of entry into the larger culture of the country. And then when I had the opportunity to have some influence in it, I, I, I will claim a small victory here because I decided that uh, we should move the radio drama and literature 
programming outside of its colonial um, you know, influence. And so I, first thing I did is I took all the British dramas off the air and replaced them with Canadian dramas. I uh, started a whole new approach to drama through the multicultural and uh, multi-ethnic uh, nation uh, sensibility that uh, uh, you know, had now grown to some kind of maturity. And so when I went to England to negotiate a new deal with the BBC, John Tideman, who was a Cambridge educated uh, uh, head of uh, a BBC radio drama, he looks at me and says, you're the one, you're the one who took my place off your air. I said, you know, John, I said, I'm here to negotiate that you can put my place on your air and we can put yours back. Um, so we started doing some collaboration. Uh, and it was the first time, I think, uh, uh, certainly in my experience at the CBC, where we were speaking on equal terms with the BBC. That is, they had a good product to offer, but we also had matured to the point where we were also offering uh, good uh, programming. And these were you know, plays by Michel Tremblay, Carol Shields, Michael Ondaatje, uh, the stellar, the, 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 the people who had matured into the culture and who had a point of view that was more Canadian and less colonial than previous uh, uh, generations. So from this point of view, I was very happy to go into management because the only way you can change things is through management. And uh, uh, that's one story. The other story is that the other, the, the other experience that I had, I should say, uh, concerns the so-called uh, Canadian Literary uh, Competition, the CBC Radio Literary Competition, which was on the verge of, um, uh, of being uh, you know, terminated. And I said, this is such an illustrious institution here that we cannot possibly terminate this. We have to change it for the times. So Robert Weaver and I and uh, John Fraser, who then was the editor of uh, Saturday Night Magazine, and uh, Air Canada um, bought into an idea of mine, which is that we would make the competition bilingual. In, in, it was a, there was a Quebec aspect to it. So, and CBC and the Air Canada would publish the winning entries. And the Canada Council, would provide the money. So it would cost the CBC nothing. In other words, we, 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 resor we found resources outside of the CBC. And I, I'm very happy to, to, to say that the CBC, this literary competition uh, is still going on um, bilingually on CBC radio. And many young writers have uh, uh, won this competition, including Mary de Michele, for instance, one of our most uh, beloved poets in the Italian-Canadian um, uh, community. So uh, I think I was lucky to be uh, offered the position to nudge, if, if you like, nudge us away from a colonial attitude in literature and drama into a more uh, uh, authentic expression of our own selves. So what happened, of course, is a, a new generation of actors came in uh, who came from very different backgrounds. So a new sound came in. It no longer needed. We no longer needed to sound like the BBC. We sounded like the language we speak on the streets. And so you know, we, we started radio program, radio drama programs that mirrored our own culture. When I left the CBC, radio drama probably had fulfilled its uh, role, and uh, um, it actually came to an end. I think just after I I, I, I left, uh, uh, I have some nostalgia for it. Uh, midway through my career, midway through my life, as Dante would say as well, uh, I went into a bit of a crisis about identity, who I was, what I was doing, where I belonged, and so on. And I realized at that point that if it hadn't been for Mr. Ed Wiley, the principal at the Blue Collegiate Institute, who led me into, uh, back into school, that who knows what might, might have happened, how I would have turned out. So I decided that it was time to actually write a, a letter of thanks, a belated thank you letter to uh, Mr. Ed Wiley, which I did. And I wrote a, a lovely, uh, what I thought was a, 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 an appropriate expression of my gratitude, describing what I was doing and, what, uh, uh, and how he must have been probably the most important influence in this. Without him, it would not have been possible. Anyway, I said to put this letter in the mail and I heard nothing. But a couple of years later, I get a call from the United States and uh, the man at the other end of the line said to me, Mr. Pietro Paolo, does the name Wiley mean anything to you? And I said, the name Ed Wiley means a lot to me, yes. He says, well, my name is Thomas Wiley. I am Ed's son and I'm calling you from uh, Kansas, I think it was where he was calling. So I'm coming to Toronto and I would like to meet you. 
uh, because you wrote, you wrote this letter to my, to my father. I said, so I'd be very pleased. So he came to Toronto, he came to the CBC. I gave him a tour of the radio drama department and all that stuff. And after that, we sat down to talk about uh, what he wanted to talk about. And he mentioned the fact that uh, this letter had shown to the family a side of their father that they didn't know he possessed. Because see, they, they thought of him as a very strict door or dow or whatever the pronunciation of that word is, Scotsman. And it turns out, in addition to me, he also had a couple of other boys that he had uh, let in through, uh, through the school. And uh, Thomas Wiley said, you do realize that he broke the law of, uh, at that time because you had to be 23 and older to be. I said, well, I'm very glad he did. I said, because uh, I, I, I owe my career and my Canadian life to, to his uh, taking this measure. And he said, well, we thank you because we did not know what uh, this side of my father. And I said, well, let's keep in touch, you know. And uh, six months later, he called me and he said, Damiano, he says, you may want to know that Ed passed away last night. And I said, where is the funeral home? And I went to the Eulid, to the funeral home. And it was at Humphrey's funeral home in Toronto on Bay Street, on uh, Davisville, I think, somewhere in, in, in North Toronto. And during the eulogy, uh, uh, Thomas Wiley mentioned the, this aspect of the... Uh, uh, of his father's life, that he had uh, uh, taken a chance with me, who was in the congregation and had come to pay his respects. And that brought to a closure, I think, uh, a, a career for me, not, not, not a career, but it brought to a closure um, an event that uh, had been so crucial in my formation, in my education, and in my you know, growth as a Canadian. And the question for me is uh, that, uh, in my life, I have moved to become a Canadian. And here I am now, struggling with the fact that I am a Canadian, but there is this Italian thing that keeps pulling at me and pulling at me and pulling at me. And so we exist in this particular kind of uh, uh, tension, if you like, between the two cultures. And I remember the, uh, in 2008, uh, Monsieur de Clétio, who won the uh, Nobel Prize for Literature, and who is not French, uh, that is, he's not French born. He's uh, French from uh, Mauritius, I believe. And he was asked about uh, his home. Where, where is home? Where is here, as Northrop Fry might put it. And he said, ma maison c'est ma langue. And so here I am, uh, not speaking a word of English in great, you know, when I was 12 years old in the playground at uh, St. Francis of Assisi School, to living fully in English. So ma maison c'est ma langue. And in many ways, the English language has become my home. I was able to, I think, because of the two languages, because of the two cultures, to be fearless in terms of questioning the colonial heritage of the country and to, to, to you know, bring a, to help to foster a new sensibility about who we are. And in Toronto, who we are has changed drastically since I arrived here in 1959, because there I was in a Roman Catholic school um, being given a traditional Roman Catholic education. Uh, and eventually, uh, I realized that uh, this was a constitutional right for me to be, to, to access my Catholicism. It still is in many ways that Toronto, you know, the, the, in Ontario, there is a Catholic school board that still exists because it is a constitutional uh, right from the, the, you know, the BNA Act of uh, 1867. But uh, eventually, Toronto changed. At the time when I was here, Toronto was a very Protestant nation. I remember on a Sunday, you couldn't go to the movies. You couldn't go anywhere. And I, I said, well, it's Sunday. Why aren't, why, why aren't we celebrating in the piazza? But it wasn't because it was, you know, and you couldn't buy wine. At the, you had to go and bring it in a brown bag and you had to take the number down. It was just like a very, very um, conservative um, northern Protestant life. But with the immigration coming in, Toronto changed. Toronto is now more of a Catholic city than it, than it was you know, when I first got here. And in terms of the population, 60% of us in Toronto are born outside of Toronto. And many, many, the majority of that, of those people come from Catholic countries. So we have brought in uh, a different kind of uh, sensibility. Uh, I would think that it's, it's, arguable, it's arguably true that Catholicism is much more, more given to spectacle and to ritual and to uh, you know, uh, the demonstration uh, as opposed to more of an inner 
sensibility. And uh, I think that the, one of the things that has happened as a result of that is that particularly with a very large Italian presence in Toronto, you do realize that Toronto is one of the largest Italian cities in the world. I think it's the fourth or fifth one. It's larger than Genova in many ways. So there's an Italian presence here that has transformed the city from a Protestant city into more of a Catholic um, city. And uh, I'm happy to have been part of that uh, in, in, a way, in whatever small way I was able to, uh, to, to bring that kind of sensibility to work within the confines of the CBC. Um, in this, in this uh, you know, um, struggle to become Canadian, I had a, th with uh, three or four other friends, uh, colleagues, we formed a theater company in the 1970s. And we were doing what I would call nostalgic theater. We were doing Pirandello, we were doing Goldoni. And at some point I said, this is the past. We've got to do something else. So we decided that we would take current Canadian plays, translate them into Italian, and bring them to an Italian speaking audience in Toronto and in Italy. And our first venture into this was a very successful one. It was a translation of Michel Tremblay's A toi pour toujours ta marie Lou, which we produced in Toronto uh, at the Hart House Theatre uh, in 1977, I think it was. And then we brought to, to Rome for the world premiere in Italian. And uh, when we got to Rome, uh, the, uh, we, we were caught in that kind of... Uh, no man's land, that is the, the home of immigrants, if you like. Uh, the Italians didn't know what to make of us. Uh, the English didn't know what to make of The Anglo population didn't know what to make of us because we were a, a, a young troupe of Italian-Canadian actors presenting a French-Canadian play in Italian in Rome. Uh, I spoke to Michel Tremblay about this. He said, I still have the posters. He's very grateful to you. He said, there was an interesting idea to, to do the, 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 this play. Of course, the play has been done in many, many other languages. But one of the things we faced was how to translate the joual. We took Pasolini's example by saying that the language of the street is what we should be doing. And uh, certainly that's what we did. So there was blasphemy, and, uh, but it was from, from the language spoken in the streets of Rome and in the streets of Palermo and Naples. We did not use an archaic, uh, uh, you know, um, Italian for the translation. And it proved to be quite a success, both in Italy and in Toronto. I thought that once we've done this, that there, there's room for a bilingual theater company in Toronto. And uh, it turns out that th th there was, but only on a small scale. And that's when I rejoined the CBC. I said, I'm done with being Italian. I want to do some substantial work. And it was possible to do it within the CBC. So at that point, I started a collaboration with writers like Michael Ondaatje and uh, Timothy Findlay and others. And we um, wrote original plays for uh, CBC Radio. That's also helping to move CBC Radio more towards the expression of a Canadian identity. Uh, and less of a colonial one. When it was time for me to leave the CBC, I re rejoined the university community as an adjunct professor of drama at the University of Toronto Drama Centre. And it was here that I was exploring the philosophy of sound production and the dramaturgy of sound. And uh, uh, to my surprise, uh, graduate students were really interested in this subject. And so we began producing sound poetry and uh, uh, one of the things that I am uh, very proud uh, of in my own production is that I, uh, after my father passed away, I decided that um, I would do uh, a sound poem as a eulogy to my father. And this was uh, some years ago now, but uh, um, um, it mixed his voice in the family with poetry, with sound, with music, and it was a 15-minute um, tribute to him, but it was mostly uh, a sound poem. I'm interested in sound poetry and sound sculpture, and there is an organization that sponsored it called, uh, they're called uh, New Adventures in Sound Art, where they, stu they still do this kind of work, and that did very well at the um, Pre-Italia in Venice in 2008, where it uh, won a special prize, so I'm very very proud uh, uh, of that. I, you know, as a, as a freelance person now, I also do some playwriting. I've done uh, um, 
uh, a play called uh, Love Letters from the Empty Bed based on uh, the Amores of uh, Ovid, which was performed uh, in Toronto, uh, um, both at the Drama Centre. I, I did it with a group of women who are, who are students of mine. So it's for, it's for nine women to, uh, uh, to perform it. And it was also done at the Canadian Opera Company uh, lunchtime uh, theatre project that they have over there. I have uh, translated and adapted Federico Fellini for the uh, stage, uh, uh, which was done at Stratford uh, uh, Festival. And then I'm, I'm now simply working on translation of novels from the Italian. Yes, I am here and I am happy here. But I long to be somewhere else at times and I do have a small place in, uh, in Italy where, where I do go uh, for recharging the uh, um, you know, creative uh, juices, as it were. Uh, and I think that uh, that's important. You know, there's, I, I believe I'm quoting this correctly, uh, but I, I, I may be wrong. But I think it was William Kennedy, an American author, who said, you can never escape your, uh, your class or your geography. I think he's wrong about the class. People can escape from that. But your geography it stays with you. Uh, immigration opens up a wound that is very difficult to, to scar, to, to, to you know, put together. So that opens up once in a while. And, one, and, and if you give in to the call of the homeland, um, you can um, you know, uh, feel much better about this whole thing. And so yes, I am happy, but I do have this nostalgia for, uh, and that nostalgia informs my present, and my present is here. <laughs>